Okay. So we are going to be talking about routines today. And um, before we start that, I'm going to talk a little bit about me. So um, I am the parent coordinator and coach for Ensemble Therapy. Um, I'm also the owner and co-founder of Hill Country School Psychology Services. And we do psychological evaluations in the private school setting, as well as independent educational evaluations for public schools across Central Texas. Um, I am a licensed specialist in school psychology. I am also a former elementary school teacher. I taught most of my years in third grade, but I did do second grade for one stint. Um, and then I'm also a mom of three girls. So we're going to be talking today about some best practice situations. And then we'll also talk a little bit more realistically, um, because we can't always be best practice parents. So to help me frame my kind of points that I'm going to be making, if you guys could drop in the chat um, who you are, you don't have to say your names or anything like that, just like um, kids, like what their ages are, or you can unmute and say that right now, um, just so I kind of have an idea of that. And I'll put it here. So let's see. Like if your kids are three or if they're five. Okay, okay. Let's give a couple more or a minute or so for other people to answer. And routines are gonna be really effective for basically any kids. Um, once they're about two up through you know, adulthood, they can be very effective, okay. 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 That helps me kind of form the direction that I'm going to go in. So I'm going to see about that. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be recognizing how consistent routines um, can help your family improve functioning. Um, with the parent coaching that I provide with parents, that is one of the first things that comes up when I'm talking to them. You know, it's, I'll say, well, tell me about the routines that you have in place for wherever you're having difficulty. And if they say, what routines do they look blank? Then that's a good jumping off point for us. Um, we're also going to determine and develop some effective morning, afternoon, and traveling routines. The traveling routines are more geared at your elementary age students. The teens don't have as much difficulty with that, but it's just one slide. So you can kind of zone out for that at times. And then we're going to talk about the ways that children can practice independence through developmentally appropriate chores. And that'll be geared more towards your early elementary so you can kind of better understand what chores they can be doing at what ages. All right. So first up, why do kids need routines? So this is something that I could probably spend the entire presentation talking about, about why routines are important and why you should do them but I've condensed it for your own sanity into one slide. So basically what we found is that kids and families that have routines um, are more advanced socially, emotionally. It can also help them a lot in school, in the school setting. Um, if you go into any classroom, you know, from the pre-K three all the way up through high school, those teachers have really consistent routines. And they've taught the kids those routines. And then the kids are going through those routines independently. And when you walk into a classroom that has good, solid routines in place, the kids are following them. It can be really beautiful. And those are the classrooms where we say, wow, their classroom management is so good, even though it doesn't look like they're actually managing their behavior. What they've done is set up these consistent routines and put them in place. Something that has been really interesting um, that we've seen as educators in the classroom setting in this kind of like post 2020 time point is that the executive functioning skills of kids and teens is lower than we've ever seen it. Um, teachers are routinely saying to me when I go into a classroom, like, wow, my third graders this year do not know how to follow my routines. I'm having to start from very scratch. Even the, you know, the teen families I'm working with them, there's no impulse control. They're really struggling with that, um, with phones, with just like wanting to do something and then going and doing it. And one of the things that I think is going to come out in research as people research this time point in our lives um, is that that 
for some reason, something happened and I have some hypotheses as to what, but something happened when kids were at home or when we were more in our bubbles that really impacted those executive functioning skills. And it's going to be some time before they, you know, recover, catch up, what have you. One of the ways that we know that we can help our kids foster those executive functioning skills, which are like planning and problem solving, delayed gratification, is through routines, teaching our children routines. The other piece that they can help with so much is sleep. So sleep is a tough one. And it's one that often comes up when parents speak with me is bedtime takes forever. I just can't get them to sleep. Um, and this is, you know, from both ends of the spectrum, both your toddlers, preschoolers, all the way up through your teen. And so what really helps and helps for adults too, is to have a consistent evening or bedtime routine that can set you up for good sleep and success. Because if you aren't getting enough sleep, it can impact your mental functioning. It can impact your emotions. It can impact your behavior, so many different things. And so that good sleep is very, very important. And having those good routines in place are important for sleep. Um, the other thing is, is kids do not have a lot of control in their life. Um, their lives are chaotic, you know, especially, and this again is for your early elementary, elementary, all the way through your teens. They feel like they're being told what to do, when to do it, and they don't get any choice of their lives. And so routines are really nice because they can have a part in creating their own routines and then they can follow their routines independently. So that will eliminate the like nagging, if you will, that you as a parent are telling them 60 times to get on their shoes. Instead, it's going through and walking through their routine and making sure that they've done all those things. All right. So a few positive things that can come from dun, 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 consistent routines and schedules, obviously making a consistent theme here, but some of the things that we already discussed, okay? Um, it can really help um, your kids if you have more than one child get along a little bit better if they have their set routines that they're working through. Um, that is something whenever I notice like a pickup in the spike of um, fighting amongst my kids, I'll kind of look at our routines and be like, oh, I've fallen off those or, oh, it's summer, or, oh, we're traveling or, oh, this has happened or that has happened. And it's when we're away from those really consistent routines, that's where I see a definite increase in that fighting, um, which as a parent of multiple kids is fighting is not fun to listen to ever. Um, it can help generally with behavior like we spoke about. Um, it can help it trend in that positive way. Um, it can also help them from a younger age, go through and complete tasks independently. That is such a huge piece um, when you're working with young children is getting them to independently go through and complete their own tasks. I routinely talk to parents of teens who I'll say, you know, what chores are they doing? Oh, they don't do any chores. Okay, um, how about self-care? Oh, I have to remind them to brush their teeth or I have to remind them to shower. I still wash their clothes. Like these are things that they should be independently working through and doing. Um, and so having routines in place can help them understand when they need to do it and you're teaching them how to do it. Um, it can also, like we spoke about before, help them feel more secure and confident. It is so much nicer if you are able to move through your routine independently rather than, like I said earlier, you have someone constantly, like typically a parent saying over and over again, did you do this? Hey, did you do your homework? Hey, did you do this? I know this project is due. Instead, if they can have it organized and set themselves and they're doing it independently, everyone's going to be much happier. And you as a parent are much happier. It never feels good to nag over and over again. It's exhausting. All right. So routines are really good for your family system as well. That's one of the things that we look at all the time in counseling is you have a child and they may be having their own struggles or what have you. But then you have your whole family system and every person in your family impacts the other person. It's all these overlapping kind of, um, you know, rings and webs and all those pieces, what have you. And so everyone in the family is going to be a lot more happy if everyone, including parents, has their own routines. Um, it can also help create more of a calmer household because it's going to be less loud because you're not nagging and yelling. Um, it can help your children establish those really healthy habits. Um, we find that like if families 
cook together or if families have an evening or afternoon routine that involves some sort of participation around dinner, you're more likely to eat dinner together. You're more likely to have a healthier meal. Um, it can help you as a parent remember things. Oftentimes, um, and you'll see it um, in one of the later slides, like in our house, we have everything written out for what we're supposed to do. And every single person in my family, including myself and my husband, are looking at that board trying to remember, oh, oh, we got to do this or that as part of our morning routine because we're exhausted and it's hard to remember things in the morning. Um, it can also help you have those like special daily ritual times with your kids. Part of their routine could be, you know, if it's, you know, a teen a show or like a, you watch a show together or play a video game together. Or if it's a younger child, it might be cuddling or reading a book or laying down with them in bed. But having that time together as part of, you know, for just you two, um, as part of your daily special routine is really beneficial because it can help build in automatically that special time. Because so often as parents, we're like, I've got to go work or I've got to answer 60 billion emails or whatever it may be. Um, having that routine in place can help you follow that consistent routine as well and be more checked in. Can also offer stability um, in times of stress and change. So, you know, that's one of the things that I talk to families about a lot before the school year starts. Get your routines in place so that when the school year starts, they don't feel as much shock because they still have their kind of bookends, their morning routine and their evening routine in place the same. Um, my family's about to move. And so one of the things that we're really kind of digging down on right now is those routines for our family, because then when we move, we're going to take our routines with us. It's going to be in a new place, but it's still going to be the same routines. And it helps with the sort of flow of our family. All right. So hopefully I've sold you on why routines are important. If not, um, we can, you can, I'll have time for questions at the end and you can ask it. Um, and I'm not saying either with that, that routines have to be every part of your life. And if you break a routine that, you know, things are going to fall apart or anything like that. What I'm saying is it's nice to have consistent routines in place that work for your family that are flexible and that, you know, help with all those parts that we just spoke about. Okay. So developing consistent or developing effective routines is pretty simple and you want to keep it simple. Um, I talk with parents all the time that have these super complex routines. And as I'm listening to them describe it, I'm kind of zoning out because it's so hard to maintain and follow. And I'm like, I can't even follow this. I don't know how your, you know, your eight-year-old is. Um, and so just keep it really simple. Keep it visual and visual meaning like for your little kids, pictures, for your older kids, writing words, but keep it visual so they can see it. That really makes a difference. Um, make them family decisions and also be consistent. And I'm going to talk about all those different parts, um, on individual slides now. Okay. So here using visuals and being succinct. Okay. So here's two different examples of visual routines. So this first one right here, this one, what they've done is they basically have all the things that this child has to do on these little cards. And then once they're, they have a to-do part and then a finished part. And once they're finished, they can move the card over. This gives them that flexibility of um, getting to choose their own order, but everybody's agreed on what they have to do after school. This is one that's really good for, um, I used to just say a toddler. And then now, now that I've worked with enough teens, I'm like, or teens, um, anybody, um, because it's everything has its place everything has its steps and everything has all the supplies they need. So you can't lose your toothbrush if it's part of your routine and it's right there. Okay. Now, some people don't want, you know, a caboodle thing on their counters and that's fine. You got to make it work for you. Um, but it's really nice and it's really effective, especially if each kid has their own caboodle. Okay. The other part that you have to do is get buy-in, right? Because you can't just go at home after this presentation and be like, well, guess what, gang? We're doing routines and this is what it's going to be. So having them work with you to create the routines is going to be really, really important, okay? So what that means is talking to your kid. And obviously the conversation looks different depending on their age, but I'll kind of aim it for elementary school, like middle of elementary school, okay? So sitting down on the weekend or sometime when we're not stressed and saying to them, hey, 
In the mornings, I notice that I yell and you cry and everyone fights. So I really want us to have a good morning routine that everyone can agree on. What are the things you need to do in the morning? And I guarantee you they know, okay? Um, my six-year-old knows. I bet you the my, my two-and-a-half-year-old knows what she's supposed to do in the morning. It's just everyone forgets in the morning and they're tired and groggy, okay? So going through and getting those routines kind of labeled out of what they're supposed to do, okay? And then making sure that you as a parent are giving reinforcements for that. It doesn't mean like a prize. Um, and I'm a really bad um, prize, giving a prize parent. Um, it's called a token economy. I just am super forgetful about that. And so any sort of reinforcement, it could be like, wow, you went through your routine all by yourself today. That is super impressive. Amazing. Like, well done. Um, you know, anything like that is a reinforcer. And so what you're going to do is as they're first starting a routine, you're going to give them a consistent reinforcer, which means like every time, even if you have a younger kid, as they're going through, you just brush your teeth. Oh my gosh, you get to lift up your flap or move down your flap or however your routine looks, or even just like a, that's super cool. Like way to go. And then you're going to move to a more variable reinforcement, um, system, which if you kind of remember like psych 101 and Pavlov and his dogs, that's where we're getting that from. Um, and so what that means is just like, not every time are you giving the reinforcement because that kind of becomes redundant instead every so often you're like, Hey, oh my gosh, like you went through your routine together. You went through your routine this morning so fast that we have time to bike to school, walk to school or stop and get a donut on the way, like whatever it may be. So like variable reinforcing that so that they still notice that you are noticing it's huge. All right, consistency. This is for parents, the toughest part, okay? Um, we are just not consistent people. It's hard. You have your work, you have your day, you have your all these other parts, your own stressors. Um, it's really hard for us as parents to be consistent and give our kids consistently this feedback, okay? Um, I think it was easier for me when I was in the classroom as a teacher to have these consistent routines in place because that's my profession and that was my career. Um, but at home, it's hard to maintain. So just know as a parent that you need to build in some reinforcers for yourself um, and you need to have some pieces in place so that you can be consistent with them because that's one of the things that happens the most frequently is parents fatigue on the routine and then the routine drops off and nobody does it anymore. And then all of a sudden they're having these behavior problems and we're like, what's going on? So making sure, especially as you initially start the routines that you're checking in regularly, um, like at the end of the day, like checking in, Hey, how'd the routine go for you today? Anything that stuck out? Oh, wow. Like you, you realize that you're out of socks. Okay. Well, let's, you know, we'll make sure to get those washed tomorrow or something like that. Just checking in with them about their routines. Okay. And this is for eight, you know, any age. The other thing is model following your own personal routines. Like if you want to post your own personal routine, that's a great idea. Um, they need to see that you have your routines that you're following as well. And that helps you be successful. Um, and that's really powerful for kids to see and kids slash teens to see their parents modeling things. Um, because they'll often feel like it's not fair. They never have to do this, or they're never listening to me about this. It's like, well, actually I am doing this, but they just don't always notice it. So describe it, write it out, model it. Um, again, don't forget about the reinforcers. That's the best way to teach someone behavior, a behavior. That's what we've learned. You can think about it. Like I said, with Pavlov and his dogs and how, you know, he would ring the bell and they would salivate because he had trained them when he rang the bell, he was going to give them food. Um, and so kind of putting that is a little in a little bit smarter of a kind of capsule for your children. When you give someone a reinforcer, they do something. So when I work, I get paid. That's a reinforcer. Same for you guys. Okay. So when your kids follow their routines, they need some sort of reinforcer to want to continue doing it. And again, like I said, it doesn't have to be a token. It could be like your time. That's one of the most valuable reinforcers we can give our kids. Um, the other thing can be words. Um, it could be a hug. I mean, anything. Um, they're, they're pretty easy as far as what's a reinforcer. They just need a reinforcer.
The other one is be a good listener. If a routine isn't working and they're telling you it's not working either through their behavior or through their words, listen, tweak it, change it. It's not working for them. It's not going to work for you. All right. So here's the shot from my house. This is a very real shot that I took because obviously our board is messy. I've got, you know, my little one, has got her handprints all over it as I was doing it. Um, but this is what our board looks like every single week. So basically we've got, so I have older kids. I have a 10 year old and a six year old and, a, and then the baby. So she has a different routine, but um, so we've got morning routine, got the afternoon routine. And then I also have their lunches that they can have at school. So that I, they know if they're going to be choosing lunch at school or purchasing, and then our own kind of like what we're doing at night. Um, and so for us and for our family, it works really well to have a command center, um, like basically a spot in your home where you can post all your routines. Um, for some families, they don't like aesthetically how that looks, or they just don't want that. And so everyone posts it maybe in their room on their mirror or something like that. Um, so just making sure you have a space in your family that, um, that works to post this so that you can have that kind of like command center. The other thing is to plan ahead. So every single Sunday I do that so that they can see what's going on in their week. They can see, you know, what they have to do as far as their morning and afternoon routines, which spoiler doesn't change. Um, and then they can also decide like what days they have to prepack their lunches or what days, you know, they want to tweak certain things so that they can have that kind of autonomy and choice over that. So being prepared is the best. Now, are those are there weeks where I am not as prepared? Yes, absolutely. I'm human. So that's just a teachable moment for my kids that I was, you know, working or I had this going on or that going on and I didn't get to it. So we have to all be flexible, but they're able to be more flexible because we have those routines so solidly in place. All right. Okay. So now I'm going to speak a little bit about traveling routines, because this is something that often comes up with families, either in the start of summer, at the end of summer, or as we're going closer to the holiday season, we're kind of split in the middle of all of that, but I'm just going to go over it. I just, like I said, at the start, it's just one slide talking about it. You can review it more or again, before you're traveling or taking a trip or whatnot. Um, so before you take a trip, even if it's a weekend camp out, um, make sure you have a family meeting before you leave. And what I mean by that family meeting is sitting down as a family and talking through expectations so that everybody knows what to expect. We're going to be in the car for four hours. I'm going to, you know, have rented DVDs from the library, or you can have your phone for unlimited or whatever it may be. Um, but having that conversation with your kids and also as parents to really get on the same page. Um, make sure that you're packing as much healthy snacks as you have the time or ability to do. Sometimes as a parent, there is healthy snacks galore in the car. I, like we've got our, you know, fruits, we've got our cheeses, we've got our vegetables, and I've even sliced things. Sometimes I don't even have time to get the individual packs of goldfish. And I just bring that big box and I just pour it into a cup <laughs> like for each kid. So it's whatever works best, but trying to pack those snacks because they ultimately are going to be hungry. And if you're filling up on food along the way, um, you know, crankier kids will kind of be snacky and grumpy. Um, giving your child as much ownership over what they pack as possible. So that means that they're packing. So in your family meeting, you're making a list of, okay, you need to bring three pairs of shorts. You need to bring five pairs of underwear. You need to bring three t-shirts, two sweatshirts, whatever it may be, making that list together and then having them do it. And some people think when I'm talking like this, that it's just for little kids, but I have met grown adults who don't pack for themselves. So this is a skill that is a life skill that should absolutely be reinforced. So every single person. And if you're, you know, we had a trip where our six-year-old didn't pack any socks or underwear for herself, even though we went over it and she checked it off and that's a natural consequence. And then she learns that, um, and she hasn't had that problem again. Um, obviously your younger kids, you want to help out. Um, but there gets to be a point where it's, it's them learning how to take care of their bodies and themselves. Um, Make sure that for you, especially your little kids, but some kids that are teens also really appreciate having a lovey or something with them that um, smells like home. 
So those times when they become overstimulated or dysregulated or just grumpy, um, because everyone throws a tantrum on a trip, doesn't matter how old they are, um, that they can kind of go to that, like smell is such a huge piece for, for us as humans. And so having that sort of piece that smells like home. Okay, limiting screen time. This is like an asterisk. If you do unlimited screen time on, you know, car trip, plane trip, whatever the trip may be, um, you just ultimately know you're going to deal with crankier kids. Now, are there times when I've done unlimited screen time because I want it to be quiet in the car? Absolutely. I'm human. Um, but did I know I was going to deal with a tantrum and screaming when we got to where we were going? Yeah. So just expect it um, and accept those consequences, like I said. Um, the other thing is, is, and this is tough, especially when traveling with family, um, but trying to keep to your home routine as much as possible. If you can give your kids those routine anchors, they're going to have much better behavior. All right, so this one I've linked through and I'm gonna click on it and make sure it lets me take it. Let's see, I might have to share to a different screen. So let me do that. Hold on a second. Oh, you guys, can you guys see the, um, the developmentally appropriate page or no? Yes, ma'am, we can see it. Oh, super, okay, yeah, good. Yeah, we're there. Technology works, okay. So I put together, and this is linked through the presentation so you can see it, some developmentally appropriate chores for different ages of kids. Um, and so I started at 12 months because I didn't know how young some people's kids were going to be, um, but I did it all the way up through 10 plus. So you can see the different types of chores that are appropriate for your child because that's something that comes up a lot. Um, you know, I'll have parents that are like, well, they're only three. I just don't think they can do that. And yeah, I mean, I don't expect my three-year-old to be like, you know, on a hot stove or anything like that, but I do expect that they can unpack the dishwasher. Um, they can also put their clothes away in drawers, or if you have baskets, um, they can do a lot of things by themselves if they're taught how to do it. Um, same with your older kids too. That sometimes comes up as far as like, you know, what kind of cleaners can they use? You know, obviously you don't want them like spraying it in their face, but if you teach them how to do it and you can tell that they're going to be responsible about it, then that will help. Okay. I'm going to, so that you'll have access to when you're looking through it by clicking on, you guys are back on the screen. Yeah. By clicking on the, um, the developmentally appropriate routines, um, board, right. Or, or link right here. So basically when you're working with kids to do the, I have to switch my screens around, hold on just a sec. All right. When you're working with your kids to do these different routines, um, you really wanna make sure that you don't force them. Um, you never wanna force them to do something that they don't want to do. Um, you wanna make sure that um, you teach them alongside and do it together. Um, looking for child size brooms, mops, utensils. That's awesome. Um, they have like, you know, even like small milk jugs, like make it like you can just get from a craft store so they can pour their own milk and prepare their own breakfast. Like you can't expect kids to do things, um, the sim the same way as adults, um, because they have small hands and they're not as strong. So make sure that it's sized down for them. Um, uh, one of the really cool things, and I'm not trained in Montessori, but one of the cool things about my job now is I get to go and see lots of different private schools. And one of the classes I, or types of schools I get to see is a Montessori setting. And they're very big in the Montessori education about um, the children doing things independently. And so they have all those small little utensils and small supplies for the kids to independently do all these parts. And it's pretty cool. Um, okay, the other part is making sure as you're teaching it to them that you are really slowing down and showing it to them. That even is for your middle schoolers, your late elementary. If you're teaching them how to do something, show them how to do it with patience. Don't do it at a time when you're super frustrated because no one's done their chores, you know, do it at a time when you can be really patient with them. Um, and then also kind of check in with them, give them those reinforcers, like, wow, you clean the toilet so well, I can tell, you know, blankety blank, whatever it may be. 
um, you know, thanks for putting the bleach away when you finished with it or what, what have you. Um, but making sure that, um, that you're kind of graduating out is after you teach it to them that you check in and see how they do until they can do it independently. They won't be able to do it independently right away. Um, making sure that like you can make it fun to do chores and household components together, you know, play fun music, um, let them watch TV while they're folding laundry if they can focus on two things at once. Um, that can be something that that's really fun for them. The piece that's tricky for a lot of parents, myself included, is kind of letting go of that perfectionism. Um, you know, if you are telling a two-year-old like to walk, wipe a table down, I mean, obviously they're not going to do it as well as you or I. And so just trying to let some of that go as you scaffold those skills and teach them those different parts. Um, and just know that it's going to feel like work for you as a parent at first, but you're not going to have an 18 year old leaving for college that doesn't know how to do laundry. So it's important to teach them these skills. It's important for your family and how things are run that they know these skills so that they can offload some of that work for you as a parent. Um, and it's important that they're developmentally appropriate. Okay. All right. So like I said at the beginning, um, we're gonna talk about how to make your own actual routines. And so I'm gonna scroll over so you can see Sam's routine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you guys different um, PDFs and you can make something like he did. It's very simple. Well, he obviously didn't do it. Someone with better fine motor skills did, but um, it's very simple. It's just a file folder. His is one of those legal file folders that's cut and they put little cards in and then they put Velcro here and Velcro there. Um, you can do it like this. You can also just, let me scroll back to my cards. You can also just, I'm going to give you right here on the morning routine, evening routine. It's going to be linked through the presentation. You can just cut it out each one and put tape on the back and put it on their mirror. And then they can go through and pick out what order they want to do every morning or every evening. And then you'll know when you see it as they move it over what they've done, or maybe they'll just even have their routine there and they can follow it independently. And that can work really well too. Um, and then if you have ones that aren't on here, you can just have them make their own. They can, kids love doing any sort of arts or craft product. Um, so they could maybe draw their own. Or if you have a kid that um, like most um, kids, well, most all kids, but six and under are so egocentric. They love to see themselves. So you can take photos of them doing these different routines. And then you can just put tape on the back of that so they can see the different routine that they have to go through and they can see themselves going through those different routines. Um, and like I said, I've also linked the evening routine. So you can take those PDFs and do with as you please to help put in place a routine. Um, as you saw for our routine in my family, we have it just written at this point, but we did start out with picture ones as um, they were younger. Um, and then they just graduated to the writing one because honestly, as a parent, you got to look at what works for you and it's simpler for us. And I'm able to be more consistent if I can just write it out. Um, but for our youngest, we still use the, the picture routine cards and that helps her identify what she needs to do. Right. And I'll send this, like I said, to Dana afterwards and she'll send it out to you guys. All right, so that is the end of the presentation portion, but I went over a lot of parts and I went over it very fast. So I wanna make sure that I give a lot of time for questions for people that have any questions um, to ask them. I'm gonna pull down the chat so I can see if you type in a question on the chat. Um, does anybody have any questions about the routines that we went over, the why behind the routines, how to implement them in your family, what a family meeting looks like, any of those parts? Wow, I did such a good job that I've like, answered everybody's questions. Hi, this is Jennifer. I do have one Hi. question. Perfect. How often do you revisit the routines? Like, is there maybe a set cadence, maybe quarterly? Mm -hmm. 
I'm sure one of the more obvious ones is, you know, before the start of a new school year, but how yeah. often do you revisit and make adjustment? That's a really good question. Um, so frankly, more often when they're younger, um, it gets easier as they get older because they're just able to follow and stick with those routines more consistently. Um, and they just don't grow and develop as much or as fast. Um, so when they're younger, like, um, preschool, early elementary, we'll either revisit it when it stops working. Like when I notice they're not following the routine, or I notice that there's much more, I don't know why I'm making it sound like we have a lot of crying in my house, but apparently we do. There's more crying in the morning or crying in the afternoon, more tantrums, more fighting. Like when I feel that pickup occur, or I feel myself fatiguing on a routine, um, that's when we'll start to look at it. Or like you said, whenever there's kind of a benchmark change. And we'll even put new routines in place, like on breaks and things like that, because otherwise I kind of, you know, as a parent, when they're off and their schedules are off because they don't have school, it's tough, you know, cause then the behaviors kind of pick up. And so we'll have a different routine during those times as well. Does that kind of answer that question? It does. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Someone asked if there'll be access to the presentation. Yes, Dana will send it out. She recorded it. Um, yeah, it's it's hard when, okay, so someone mentioned, um, it's, it feels like we fall out of routines badly when she visits, um, who's a, a child who's with you part-time. And so, okay, so that's something that I actually didn't touch on. That's a really good point. So if there is um, one child or more than one child who shares different homes, um, that can be tough because they have to code switch between the different homes and the different routines. If the parents are co-parenting and in agreement, then the best possible case scenario is to have a family meeting with everybody and come up with some benchmark or bookend, sorry, morning routines and afternoon routines. If that is not a possibility, don't worry, kids are really good at code switching. Um, it's actually a skill that they have because they got those plastic brains. Um, and so instead, what I would really highly suggest is to have a transitional routine, which means that each time that the child transitions from one home to another home, they have a routine that they follow, whether it's like how they pack things up or what they pack things up in or how you say your goodbyes or how they exit out, whatever it may be, have a transitional routine and then have your own routines in your home. That's great, Kate. I um, was a frequent foster mother, and a lot of times whenever they would go and do a, a home visit with their biological parents or have to come back afterwards, um, and they'd fall into some of those, you know, yeah. poor choices, um, for a lack of a better term, and then I, I just gently reminded them, hey, remember in our house, we do things this way in our house, you know, positively, you want to word it positively, but remember yeah. in our house, this is how we do things. Um, and it's because we love you, want to keep you safe and want to make sure that we're all doing the right things. Um, so it's good to offer gentle reminders when they come because they'll forget and you'll just have to yeah. kind of ease them back into it. Yeah. And if you know that maybe your um, like their, their other parent, um, like things don't, there's, there's not routines or um, things are more, you know, maybe chaotic or something like that. Um, kind of like, like Dana was saying, like as they re-enter, know that they're not going to be able to jump right into the structure of your home. They are going to need to transition in some way, whether that transition is a kind and comforting conversation or asking them, what do you want for this transition? And then maybe they want like just time to sit in their room and read whatever that transitional kind of piece may be for them. Like that's a really good point is that they often do have to be reminded of now you're here and here's what we're going to do. Um, and again, not to be redundant, but I would make that visual in some form or fashion, just so you can point to it. I agree with the visual. And that brings us to another chat. My um, one six-year-old kid doesn't want to do any chores and pushes back. Sometimes we have to force necessary things. It's not mm -hmm. easy. Definitely not easy. Um, I do think a visual um, would be beneficial, uh, kind of like the the folder that was shown earlier with the pictures, mm -hmm. like they want something to touch and to be able to do. They have a sense of accomplishment. Mm 
-hmm. when they can like turn something in or, or check something off. So mm -hmm. just having simple chores for them, starting easy at first and letting them take that Velcro and be able to Velcro, Velcro clothes that they've done one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, maybe even kind of figuring out some of the things that they think are fun or making it fun, start with those so that they can feel some sort of accomplishment um, in doing it. Just, and, oh, she's got it on the screen. Sam's morning routine. Yeah. They'll be excited to be able to close that shut. Like, hey, I did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having that sense of, uh, it's kind of like Dana was saying, like having a motor kind of tied to it helps. The other piece is you, looking at that developmentally appropriate chart that I linked in and making sure that there are things that are not too hard or too frustrating for them to do. Um, because six-year-olds, um, and this is from someone who has a six-year-old right now too, you know, they're fun. They are super fun. I like that age a lot, um, but they're super tough also. They're very much like the black and white rule followers. They're your kind of like policemen in the family, but they're also super <laughs> egocentric still. Um, so they're fun in that way, but like making sure that it's appropriate for them, um, you know, that, um, that might be why you're getting the pushback. The other thing you can do is offer forced choices. Um, that's what I call it. And that's just the term, but it's not really like I'm forcing you to do these choices. It's more like, okay, we as a family clean on Saturdays. And so, you know, let's make a list of the chores that we need to do. Um, and this could be a way to introduce the chores. Um, you know, which chore do you want to do? You get to go first. Um, you know, and like my six-year-old loves cleaning the toilet. I think it's the most disgusting job ever, but she thinks it's super fun because she gets to use the hands-off bleach that she's never allowed to use elsewhere, you know, and she gets to scrub and I don't know why, but so they're weird. Um, it's a fun age in that, but they are weird ones. So seeing maybe like what they want to do. And then if there gets to be a more consistent chore that they're able to manage and do, you know, some kids really like doing trash because they like that proprioceptive, like heaviness of it. Um, some kids, you know, really like doing other weird chores that you might be able to find. So asking them what they want to do, um, and having that conversation about that. Um, but they can also, you know, or getting feedback. Like if you have a pet, a six-year-old is really good at feeding their pet because they get the feedback from their pet, their pet's happy, their pet stops meowing or, you know, licks their leg or whatnot. Um, so finding, finding that just right one. Yeah, or even okay. with the time, I my high schoolers and my college kid now still has a trouble keeping her room clean. So <laughs> it's like by the end of the day, this needs to be done. I don't care when you do it, but allowing them to have that time to, you're going to play a video game. Okay, cool. By this time, I want this to be done. Um, so we've got one, my seven-year-old is the most literal person. Yeah, you might have to yeah. work with them on showing them what to do. Um I've got my 14 year old is that way. <laughs> <laughs> and for those literal ones, like, Hey, guess what? Like, since they're so good at being literal, they get to make, you know, if it's a chore, they get to write the steps for the chore and post it somewhere because they're the ones that, you know, if they want to be exact about it, then like, I <laughs> mean, sure. Um, if they're super exact about their, um, or literal about their routines, like awesome, they should make them. And you can just help them implement it by making it visual and then posting it. So you're checking in instead of saying like, I made this for you. And, you know, cause they don't, they're not ones that really like that. Okay. That's a great idea. And just being exact, like even down to make the bed, clean under the bed, um, fix the pillows. If they have to have like step-by-step step on not just cleaning your room, mm -hmm. but all of those things to do, um, all those components of cleaning your room. Um, Terry, welcome. It's okay. You showed up late. I'm recording mm -hmm. this. I will send the uh, recording link along with um, the presentation. So you'll be able to have that. Yeah. And um, so I just read yours too, Terry. So, you know, that is, so that's great that you guys as a family developed the chore slash responsibility chart. Um, it is tough when you take away an award or reward, because then, yeah, like they don't want to do it because they liked the reward. You had their reinforcer and you took it away. Um, and so, yeah, they don't want to do that same behavior. Um, and so what you have to do now um, is figure out what is going to be a good reinforcer. And it could be having a conversation with your six-year-old. I like how six-year-olds are like the topic of conversation today. Um, they are tough. Um, 
but having a conversation with your six-year-old and maybe like we talked about with the forced choices, they could pick a reward. Or if you don't want to do a reward, then it's going to be um, a conversation of like maybe the reinforcer that you give is you giving, you know, like, wow, I noticed that you did this so quickly. Like we have time now to do blank. I always like that when I can make it a natural reward. Like now that you've done this so quickly, we have time to do X, Y, or Z. Um, because that's such a reinforcer, like, oh gosh, like maybe next time we're going to have time to do this or that, um, bedtime routines are a little bit harder in that, but it could be like, wow, you went through your bed, your routine. Now we get to read a book, but you might have to do some sort of, we talked about, I don't know if you were there, Terry, when we talked about the variable reinforcer. So it might be that they get to stay up later and you're like, look, we're going to reinforce that or reintroduce that as the reward. Um, but you know, you're only going to get it you know, and kind of put them on a variable reward system. Like, and you can do that in a creative way that you can show them. Like I've got five popsicle sticks and, you know, every time you do it, we'll pull out a popsicle stick, but only one of the popsicle sticks or two of the popsicle sticks has the reward of staying up late. Um, That's kind of a lot of work for me as a parent. Um, So you can also simplify it too. Um, Not that I don't like working, but I feel like parenting is enough. It's like a wonderful, but also a lot of work. So I try to make things as simple as possible. Hey, um, Sam has a question. Sam, do you want to um, ask Kate your question? Hi. Yeah, I have a question. My child is seven years old. Okay. Um, he's between two homes. Um, and those two homes are uh, culturally different and racially different. So there's going to be code switching. Mm -hmm. Um, also add into the mix that in one of the homes, it's an intergenerational family. So I'm interested, I'm just kind of curious, like what a family meeting might look like with all of those variables in the, you know, that might be something that I need professional help with, but, um, like my other question was how do I, how might I get my seven-year-old to, start adopting these routines because I can change, you know, his environment, you know, work it and rework it. But, um, you know, I think he, he wants to do the right thing, but like getting him kind of like directed step-by-step towards those routines is kind of a challenge. So like something that came up in a parent training from, a while back was discrete conditioning you know Mm -hmm. so I was just wondering like you know all of this routine it's adopt routines it sounds it's great in theory but how do we get it to to start working in practice and is discrete conditioning um like an element in that like what is discrete conditioning so I'll talk so I'll answer both those okay so the first part talking about what the family meetings look like and how they can look different is they can really look like anything. It's, it can be any, like there's no prescription on how they look. What it is, is it's a meeting with the important people that are going to be impacted by whatever you're discussing, sitting together in a non-distracted manner and just, and, and talking. Um, I often suggest trying to make sure that family meetings are, um, on a non-stress time. So like for us, like non-stress times are the weekend, like people are just less tired and less grumpy. Um, And so that's the best, most receptive time that I get as a parent. Um, But it can look like anything. It can be like, you know, it could, you could have, you know, grandma there or, you know, cause maybe she's gonna be part of the after school routine um, and she has an opinion about it. It could be, you know, just nuclear family. It could be anything. It really, there's no, there's no rules associated with what a family meeting entails. Like I said, it's just making sure as a parent, you're non-distracted and that you're there to listen and talk. And I will say like, like I'll call them family meetings. Like we're going to have a family meeting to talk about blank. So they know what we're going to talk about. Um, You know, like, and and they might have their own thing that they want to add. And a lot of kids are used to a meeting style because they have classroom meetings with their classes or my earbuds just fell out. Um, They have classroom meetings um, regularly where they talk about pieces like that. Um, And so it's not going to be a hard surprise for them and you don't have to make it super formal. Um, It's just a time to talk about these things that come up with your family because it's 
you know, just like in a, in a job setting, like you would have a, like a monthly meeting with people that you work with. It's the same thing. Like we're just touching base about these different kind of dynamics going on. Um, and like talking about it in a non-pressured way. Um, and then talking about how to start the routine. So if you think there might be some resistance to it, just start it really simple. Just do one step of the morning routine written out. It might be that, um, you know, mm -hmm. like their job is to pack their backpack, or if that's too hard, their job is to find their backpack every single morning. Did you find, did you do your routine? Did you find your backpack? And then after they've gotten used to that routine and they have acclimated to it, then add another routine in. Some kids love routines and they can pick up just like Sam's routine and have a whole bunch right away. Some kids are more resistant to it. So start simple. Um, nobody wants to feel overwhelmed. Um, and if you start simple and move slow, then the chances of success are much higher, especially if you reinforce it. But you as a parent have to be consistent. So don't take on something if you can't be consistent with it. Cause that's the worst case is when you're like, we're going to do this grand thing and everyone's excited for it. And then, you know, you as the parent don't really follow through or you stop reinforcing it. And then the effect kind of dissipates and it's harder to start it again. Does that kind of talk a little bit about those different components? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And the, I'll say to the, um, the, the, the owner of ensemble therapy wrote a really good blog on family meetings a couple of years ago. I will find it and I'll link it on the part that I say on one, wherever I say family meetings in the slideshow, I'll link it before I send it to Dana so that you can click on it and you'll be able to tell it's linked there. Cause it'll be, um, you can, it'll be underlined. So you'll see it's a hyperlink. Thank okay. you, Kate. That'd be awesome. Do you yeah. guys have any more questions? Thank y'all so much for being here. Well, Kate, I think you did a fabulous job. Yeah. Um, do you offer any additional resources to help guide families one-on-one? -on -one? This is for you to plug yourself, my lady. <laughs> yes, I do. So like I was saying um, at the start, so I do, it's called parent coaching. So that's basically one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so what we do is you fill out some different paperwork prior to meeting so I can understand what your goals are. And then we work together for an hour um, in person or virtually on those goals. And then you basically come away with um, hopefully solutions for your family. Um, it's solution focused, which means that it's very short cycle. So typically I meet with parents a couple of times, the first time to talk about it and figure things out. And then they go and try things. And then we meet in a couple of weeks and it's kind of troubleshooting and figuring out, okay, this worked, this didn't work, or let's try this, let's try that. Um, but, but yeah, so that is something I do one-on-one. -on -one. You're more than welcome. Let me go back to the, you can contact us at Ensemble Therapy or I am just Kate at Ensemble Therapy. Um, I realized, I guess I should have put my own, my own in there. Um, I just put our general one, but you're always welcome to contact me and ask, you know, any questions that you have, or if you want to set up a session. So you guys, this is just our first lunch and learn for the year. Um, we will have more generally about once every four or six weeks. Uh, we will be bringing Kate back for more, um, more assistance from Ensemble Therapy. They've been amazing partners with us. And um, now that I have your email addresses, I will send you guys an email with the updates for the next few training classes. Um, all of them are recorded and put onto our YouTube channel. If you got the email from me, you have the link to that YouTube as well. And I will be adding the presentation um, there and I should have it up and ready for you guys and to share on Monday. If you have any questions, if there is something you'd like to see or you would like to hear more about, you can always contact me. My name is Dana Wilcott. I am at Pflugerville ISD. I am the Family Services Coordinator for PFISD. And let me just in the chat box, put my email address so you guys can see that real quick. Um, you can also just find me in the staff directory with Pflugerville ISD. Um, I'm so glad that you guys were able to be here. Uh, we are thankful for you all. 
and I hope to see you soon. Anybody have any last questions or comments before we go? All right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Kate, for being here. I can't wait to see you again.